my name is Jared Hunt. I'm the CEO for Windreath Incorporated. Uh, we are a homemaker personal care provider that uh, actually got our start right here in Sandusky County. Um, what I wanted to do when the county board asked for me to come today is not just uh, have a PowerPoint presentation that I read off of, but uh, I know that this is a topic that's either um, very foreign to some people or maybe people know about it and are very interested in it. So I wanted for us just to be able to have kind of an, an informal discussion about uh, where we're at in Ohio's DD community in relation to uh, the use of technology to support the folks that we're serving. Um, so what I figured I would do is start out by letting you know a little bit about who we are, um, how our agency has gotten to uh, the point where we are now, and to talk through that process about how we're using technology across the state and all that. Um, if I get too boring, like knock your drink over or throw something at me, totally okay if you want to do that. If you have questions, let me know. Uh, I don't want you to forget your question because you're waiting for me to stop talking because I just don't ever stop talking. So they said that this is supposed to last until 7. Let's see if we can get you done a little bit before that. How's that sound? Um, so, like I said, uh, we provide direct support services here in the county. Uh, I have been part of Winreed since day one, uh, back in 1994, which means I've been doing this for 24 years. Uh, I am happy to say that that is actually more than half of my life. This is what we've done. Um, it's not what I expected to do. When I was the, uh, the young high school, college kid, I thought that I wanted to get into law enforcement. Um, my dream was to be a U.S. Marshal, actually. So after school, I went off to college, uh, majoring in criminal justice to do that. But um, as the poor planner that I was back then, I didn't happen to think about the fact that there are physical requirements, such as your eyesight. Um, this was way back in the day before they had any sort of corrective eye surgery that would be uh, accepted by federal agencies. Uh, and the problem is I'm legally blind. So um, didn't really work out very well for me. And when I was 16, I had started working here. But what I noticed was that as I go off to school getting ready to do this exciting new career where I'm chasing the bad guys and all that, I feel that I'm being called to stay where I'm at. And I felt that every step of the way, went through business administration after that, seeing family business, that was really boring. Um, and you know, we just kind of continue on and fast forward and here we are. But I found this series of steps that, um, that we've kind of taken along the way that's really pushed us to be where we are. So um, we start out providing services here for uh, an individual that is profoundly mentally retarded. He had been bounced around from institution to institution his entire life. Uh, the issue with that is as he was bounced around to each institution, he was abused physically, uh, mentally, uh, and, and whatnot. But one of the examples is um, he had a behavior of biting people. So at that point in his life, they felt that it was appropriate as his support team to just remove all of his teeth. A horrible story. You're biting people, it hurts, we're just going to pull your teeth. Completely acceptable back then. And as he came to us with the history that he had had, uh, my father gave his word that we will provide the best possible care to him the rest of his life, no matter what that takes. And he held to that word uh, until the day he passed. We, uh, we served him, and uh, we provided the best care we knew how to provide for him. In doing that, that uh, meant that we had to provide services that were a little bit different than most people back then were willing to provide. Um, some of those services were environmental modifications. We had to make the entire home uh, accessible for him. We had to widen doorways, remodel bathrooms, build ramps, do all that stuff. Um, and that kind of set the tone for who we were as an agency in being innovative in the way that we provided supports uh, and just digging in to do that no matter what. 
Um, over the years, as we started getting into not only providing direct support services uh, and those environmental modifications, we also started uh, getting into adaptive and assistive equipment for the folks. We know that, um, you know, even using my own father, for example, uh, he, he worked for our agency until the day he died. Unfortunately, he had ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease and wasn't able to grab a spoon to feed himself. So we needed to have, you know, adaptive spoons and plates and stuff like that in order for him to be able to care for himself as much as possible, as long as possible. Well, we do that for the folks that we care for through the agency as well. Um, and some of that started with very low tech, like uh, that spoon or that plate or whatever that might be. But some of those things got a little bit more high tech. Uh, county boards would ask us to pay a local alarm company for uh, a personal emergency response system, that call button that an individual can wear and push when they need help. Um, we started doing that and kind of got a reputation, I think, for being that nerdy provider that uses technology not only to uh, serve the folks that we're serving, but to be able to operate our agency as well. So as we fast forward many years, we get to about eight years ago, where the state of Ohio started considering this thing called remote support, or back then they called it remote monitoring. Mm -hmm. um, they had seen that there were some other organizations outside of the state that were providing remote monitoring, but um, didn't really know what that was going to look like in Ohio, but they're pretty sure they wanted for that to happen. So they called me in and asked me to uh, consider this and to look at this. So we did. Uh, as an agency, we looked at what was happening outside of Ohio in the world of remote monitoring, and uh, we, we wanted to see what we like about it and what we don't like about it. But through that process, when I was considering whether or not we would even entertain the idea of providing a remote monitoring service, the one thing that I kept asking myself is, how, how can we be different than other providers, these out-of-state providers? What's our niche? What's our thing? And that was pretty easy. We are a homemaker personal care provider. That's what sets us apart from other people. And not to make this about a sales pitch, but that really set the tone for us as an organization that when we talk about remote monitoring, um, many times people feel like that's big brother watching everything they're doing. Have all of you heard about remote monitoring before walking in here today? Okay. Um, we have one no. Remote monitoring. Who here has ever thought that remote monitoring is cameras watching everything you're doing? Anyone ever hear that? think that man when I hit the road eight years ago that's what people were afraid of is it is cameras just watching absolutely everything you're doing um, I didn't really like the idea of that so as a provider as an HPC provider what can that be when we talk about remote support people tend to think that it is people being replaced with technology, people being replaced with cameras, people being replaced with robots, whatever that might be. And nothing could be further from the truth. I'll tell you, you know, just right off the bat about remote support, remote support is people being replaced with other people, and that's it. That is uh, finding a way to provide a service that is a third of the cost of what services traditionally are. Uh, finding a way to provide a service that creates freedom and independence and fosters opportunities that people would never have in their life prior to that. And so that was what we were looking at with doing that. Um, to kind of go to the, the full end of the spectrum, let's talk about what remote support is right now. Um, number one, who wants to guess? Who wants to take a guess and tell me what is remote support as you understand it right now. Anyone brave enough? What's remote monitoring? I love awkward silence. You're brand new to Ohio. What's remote monitoring? What do you know? Um, it could include uh, 
various types of electronic support such as GPS or could, it could include cameras, but perhaps not. Um, medication reminders that are sent electronically, things of that sort, um, monitoring to know if the someone's coming in the door, etc. Boy, not only did you actually respond, but you did so good, you get the light bulb <laughs> and the pad. Okay. Very good. Good work, good work. Thank you. All right. Um, yes. And, and again, it used to be that when I would ask, what's remote monitoring? And people are like, it's cameras watching everything you're doing. But here's the thing, to be fair to those people, that kind of is what it was back then. And that was the idea that people had, and we didn't want that. So here's what remote monitoring is to Winry, or what we call remote support now. Remote support is using technology to be able to bridge that gap, using technology to be able to provide supervision when it's needed. Um, with those cameras, people used to say that it's so invasive, you have cameras watching everything you're doing. Let's talk about having direct support in the home. If you've ever dealt with direct support in the home, when you put a person in there, you can't shut the person off. They're hearing everything, they're seeing everything, they're smelling everything, whatever's going on, they know about it. If I have a camera, this thing isn't working. Um, the fact of the matter is that in many uh, homes where we install cameras or remote support systems, we may have cameras in there. But even at that time, it doesn't mean that the thing's ever on. Uh, the way that these work for us, and I'll give you some examples of them, Typically, we have a fixed camera that's facing a door for video verification purposes. We know that something's happening, and we want to see what it is. The only way that this thing is on is when we have a sensor on that door. This sensor will know that the door's been open, and it'll be like, hey, camera, check this out. And then the camera will turn on and do that. Until then, our monitoring center staff do not have access to video feed to just simply watch what's happening. Uh, we want everybody to have increased privacy, increased independence, and increased opportunities to be integrated into their community. You know, right now, um, we are talking about the cost of direct support versus the cost of remote support. And, um, you know, if you just think about it in general, we can cut the cost of service delivery to provide the same level of supervision to a third of what it was. It's not simply just to save money, you know, that's great, but what if we can use that pot of money to better serve the person? What if instead of paying a direct support staff person to sleep on a couch all night long and be there just in case, because that's just what we've always done, but we can replace that with another direct support person that is always awake and always ready for anything at a less lesser cost and we can use the rest of that money to now get that person out in the community more. You know, when we talked about the transition from uh, institutional settings, whether it be nursing facilities or developmental centers starting back in the 80s, into the community settings that we're in right now, we want everybody in our lives to be integrated into their community, to be woven into that fabric of life that we're experiencing. We want the people that we're caring for, our loved ones or our consumers or whomever they are, we want them to have the same experiences in life that we do, right? That's basically what we're looking at. Now, the developmental disability system, um, if you guys are in especially the waiver world, the supported living world, the one thing that we need to talk about is the financial aspect of it. It's not working. Um, back in the 80s when we talked about uh, moving people from big group settings to more individualized settings, um, it's great. It's, it's effective at giving people the best possible life. But here's the problem. Uh, they have actually deemed it an unsustainable business model. And what that means is that the cost of providing that service goes up and up and up every year, whether that be um, the elimination of third-party companionship exemption through the Department of Wage and Hour, which means uh, staff wages go up, 
staff are getting paid overtime, which is good because they deserve it, but that goes up. Healthcare costs, as you know, are skyrocketing out of control. Every single year, they go up and up and up. Uh, there's a national staffing crisis right now. There are plenty of people at work. They just don't want to. Um, so we have that. Those of us that are in the provider community know that um, we are seeing requests for new consumers come from the county board, and, and I will say it on record right now. Um, we see those RFIs, hey, this individual needs a provider, this individual needs a provider. Typically what I do right now is delete every one of those. And what I see is the county board is sending these out over and over again because providers are no longer responding to pick up services. The reason is because it is so expensive. It costs us more money to provide direct support services than we can actually get reimbursed for. So something has to change, and that was one of the catalysts that got the state to start looking at providing the most support. So we look at that, and, um, and here we are. Now, as a direct support provider, we want to be able to provide that same care using technology. So how does that work? Um, what we do right now is we'll receive requests for people to uh, have an assessment. Hey, what? What kind of technology is out there? As you guys may or may not have heard, recently the governor signed the uh, Technology First bill in Ohio. When, um, when remote monitoring first came out years ago, in the rule, in the, in the law for remote monitoring, it said that remote monitoring can be used to replace direct support staff. Five years ago, or I'm sorry, a couple years ago, after at the five-year point for the rule, um, the state rewrote that, and they took that part out. They actually uh, they called us in, asked us to help them rewrite it, give them some language, and um, one of the suggestions that they listened to was, "We're going to take that part out where there has to be staff there that the technology is replacing." Um, fast forward to this year, the governor signs this executive order for technology first, just like the employment first initiative that came out. Um, before using other services, we have to know, are there forms of technology that could uh, effectively serve the purposes that we need in this particular situation? Um, I don't believe that it needs to be, you either have staff or you have remote support. I think that there needs to be a ton of options in between. So the way that that looks for us is we say, just be receptive to the idea that there might be a solution that makes everybody's life better. Um, and then give us a call. And we send someone out, our system technology specialist will come uh, to, to the team, to the home, wherever that needs to be, and meet with everybody. We look around, and the first thing that we're gonna look at is, why does this person need support? whether from be from family or providers or whoever that is, why do they need support? What's happening? And then we look at what kind of solutions can we provide for that? Um, some of those things might be that, well, you might have an emergency and just need to get help there quickly. Um, he might fall down and need someone to call 911. Well, even, you know, whatever the case might be, why have full-blown remote monitoring or a staff person when we can use a personal emergency response system? Um, this device is a, it's considered a personal emergency response system at, by waiver standards, uh, waterproof wearable pendant that, um, you just have it around your neck. It's got this magical lanyard on it. I don't understand how the thing works, the lanyard itself, but when I fall over, it knows and it gets help on the way for me. I can press and release the button quickly. Um, it connects with a third-party central station that um, when I need help, I can just hit the button. They say, hey, what's up? Um, can you tell Uncle Fred I'm not going to be able to make it for dinner tonight? Yep, no problem. And it can do that. Then those people, they're live people, they will call Uncle Fred and they'll say, hey, dinner's off. No big deal. But if that same person needs emergency assistance, they simply press and hold the button down, it calls 911 for them. <clears throat> yes, ma'am. Well, 
What if they're unable to even hold that down? There's no stack in the house, only that. Because they've fallen over, right. it will automatically call. It will call 911. It will, yep. It and will then know exactly where to go. Exactly. Because it has GPS in it as well. Yep. And we'll know from their profile. The neat thing is the old days emergency response systems were a button that is like a remote control connected to a base station that has a phone line plugged into it. Well, that kept you limited to about 500 feet from that device is all you could go, which means you really have to stay in your house. You might be able to get some range outside of your house, but that's really about it. Now this technology, um, this particular one operates off of Verizon wireless cell signal. Not that anyone wearing it has to have a Verizon plan. We take care of all that. But as long as it gets that cell signal, it can, it can get help no matter where they're at. So if you're wearing it around the house and you need help, no problem. But if you're at the doctor's office and trip on the curb and fall down and you're unconscious, it will know where you're at, it will alert authorities, and it will get help on the way for you. That's fine, but there's still that time frame between the time you fall and that ambulance, whatever, comes to you. Or if you're sitting down, you're starting to choke. Yep. And you're so, in the house with that. Absolutely. So the one thing that I've found is that um, we have not got a technology that makes ambulances come to your house faster. Mm -hmm. You absolutely will not get a faster response than these. Um, this is a digitally dialing device that as soon as it picks up on it, uh, this device will call quicker than you're going to call from a telephone. Um, as long as you have cell signal on it, which most places that we deliver this in Ohio get excellent signal, um, works very quickly. But you're right, we, we cannot get the medical, medical personnel, the authorities, we can't get any of those people there any quicker. Right, but if there was, if there was staff there, say it is they would be able to perform CPR or yep. whatever Absolutely. before the help came. And that's Not the same thing that you and I run into, isn't it? We, we look at the fact that um, I may choke. When I get around beef jerky, all bets are off. If you want to even talk about cheeseburgers, that's a whole other ball of wax <laughs> for me. So what do we do about that? Um, when you give me a plate of both, I may choke. Does that mean that I have direct support staff, or do, does that mean that I have the, the emergency Heimlich maneuver deliverer with me because of that? Not necessarily, but if you have someone that has a risk of choking, uh, someone that that's their history, those are the sorts of things that we want to consider. Those are the things that when we go out to perform that assessment on what's happening, we say, why does this person always have staff with them? Or why do they always have somebody with them? And we'll talk about that. And one of the things that you would tell us is, well, she can choke very easily on things. And as a support team, we talk about that. What does that look like? Does that mean that we offer uh, other things for her to have if there's a period of time where she doesn't have any staff with her or anybody there? Um, you know, speaking hy hypothetically, we want to just uh, look at the entire situation for that person and see what we can do. Um, great, but yeah, cheeseburgers, whole other story around me. Yes, ma'am. Now, when um, the button is activated, say there is an emergency and 911 is called, is there an additional phone call made to like an emergency contact, or how does that particular device, uh, like I said, goes through a third-party station that monitors it. And what we do is we give them a profile of the person. So who are they? How do we get a hold of them? Where do they live? Uh, what medications are, on, are they on? Are there any sort of um, medical conditions that we need to know about? And who can we call in emergencies? All of that information is listed for them. So as the emergency personnel are called, they can then start going down the list. They're going to get, you know, police, fire, EMS on the way first. Mm -hmm. But then after that, they're going down the list and they're going to say, hey, this is going on. You need to get over there or whatever that might be. Absolutely. And they also can tell them if there's a lockbox outside for a door that's locked, what that code is so they don't have to bust down the door. Mm -hmm. Yep. We, um, 
Now, when it comes to something like that, we can put those sorts of notes. This person is visually impaired. This person has a lock box, and here's the number to it. Um, if you go towards the, the spectrum of remote support systems, when we have those, if we have the situation that you're talking about, someone with a history of choking, let's say that's someone that is using remote support. Well, we may know that they're up and they're eating and we're watching for those sorts of things. Or if it's someone that has, and I can't give, I can't give Heimlich maneuver obviously through that, but we can do anything <coughs> except physically touch a person. Um, what if we have someone that's had a seizure? You know, it used to be, he has seizures, he can never be left alone. But we know that through the advances of technology that that may not necessarily be the case. Seizure detection is very difficult. It's tricky because of some different nuances, but the devices that they're using nowadays to detect seizures are really advanced and we're able to provide remote support in places that we had never been able to before. We do have a number of places, and, and I'll give you an example in a second, but we have a number of places where folks have uh, epilepsy or other seizure disorders, and um, we had one that, uh, a, a lady that had a seizure, we knew about it because of detection devices that are around her condo. Um, as soon as she hits the floor, there's a protocol that's specific for her. Protocol goes into place, we start getting the authorities on the way, you know, EMS shows up, but it's this uh, condominium building that has a secured front door. So we let the authorities know, here's where you need to be, here's the code to get into the front door, and when they get to her door of her home, we unlock the door for them. So they come in, that door is already unlocked, we can see them, we identify them, we're like, hey, She's over here because they see us on a two-way video device. You'll find her in that room over there. Come back to us when you have questions. We will help you out. We don't want to hinder their ability to care for her in those situations, but um, we're able to provide all medical information, anything that they need for that. So we had an individual that uh, came to us. Uh, her deal was that due to an extreme amount of seizures, they actually removed half of her brain. Um, reduced the amount of seizures greatly, but as you can imagine, created some other issues in her life, such as forgetfulness. Um, her mom is a provider here in Ohio and uh, really wanted for her to have her own home to live in. And her mom said, look, I don't think that she's going to college. I don't think that she's getting married. What I want to be able to provide for my daughter is a home for her to be in on her own. So she did that, and they called us in to be able to kind of tend to some of the needs that she had. So as part of those needs, um, one of the things is that she lets everybody into her home. Um, there were some people that they didn't really want to have access to her home, so we did what we said we would do. We stuck a camera up towards the door and the little sensor on it, so that when that door would open, if we're monitoring it, that door opens, the system turns on, and we can see who that is. If we're not monitoring, if family's there with her, or direct support staff are there with her, our system does not do anything. But, while we're monitoring, we can see who's coming in and out because of the system alerting us. Uh, when we would have unwanted visitors, that team had a specific protocol of things they wanted for us to do, and uh, we were able to do that. We were able to talk to the person, we were able to identify them and whatnot. Um, one of the other things is that due to her forgetfulness, um, she needed medication. So we got this very nice, handy dandy, fits in your back pocket sort of med dispenser here. Um, this medication dispenser uses a wireless internet connection, uh, battery, and um, battery backup system in it that what we can do with this is program this to alert her at the time she needs to take each individual medication. So when it's time for her to take medication, the compartment will light up with a white light under it, 
it starts making a really annoying noise that you want to get to stop right away, and it will unlock the compartment. So she knew when she hears that noise, she's going to come, open the compartment that's lit up, she's going to pull out the little cup, take the medication, put it back in, and be good to go. If she didn't do that, the device is going to call her and say, hey, you forgot to take your medication. And if that didn't work, it can call someone else. But under med administration protocols, it may be that, look, if you haven't taken your medication in this period of time, we need to re-secure the medication, make an incident report, and follow up from there. It's capable of doing that. This device does not get anyone around medication administration rule. We still have to adhere to the same med rule, but um, great reminder device. This is a great example of a technology that is integrated into remote support, but it can be used as a standalone technology as well. Maybe someone doesn't need full-blown remote support, and I'll tell you as a provider, we have many cases where we have had to send staff to someone's home in the morning to make sure that they're up out of bed and getting ready for work and that they've taken their medication. Or we could just put this thing in and save thousands of dollars to the waiver by just reminding them with that, and that's it. If there's a medication change, something happens, they went to the doctor, or you know, there's a consultation, the doctor says, hey, I want this medication to be passed at 8 p.m., not 9 p.m. Support team member can have access to the website that controls this. They can simply make that change on the internet, hit the save button, they don't even have to go to the house. And it will push that change down to the device, and it's been done. If they decide to go on vacation, like I said, shove that thing in your back pocket, take it with you, it'll still work. Um, some of the other things that we use, I, there are a million different examples, but let's, let's start basic. If we're talking about remote support, the way that we do that is we have to get the signal from their home to our monitoring center. Uh, our monitoring center is a uh, state-of-the-art facility that is able to handle all the incoming traffic, whatever we need to see, whatever we need to accomplish, uh, we can do right there. We looked, at, we looked at farming it out using a third-party center. But what we realized is that using third-party organizations, they would not have the customized level of uh, care. They wouldn't know what they need to know about the person. You're kind of just a number. Uh, so we decided we're going to create our own. Like I said in the beginning, we want it to be direct support staff taking care of the folks that we're serving, just like they would if they were in the home. So we have that monitoring center that those staff there know our individual's ISP, they know everything about that person, they know who they are, and they just have those relationships with them. Uh, you know, if it's four o'clock and they're coming online and we're going to start, you know, taking care of them for the night. Four o'clock, we call them up. Hey, how's it going? Good. Got home from work. Really good day. You know, whatever that is, they know each other and they just do life together. Uh, we had one guy that we had to start taking care of because he likes popcorn at 2 a.m. Doesn't necessarily like his popcorn machine very much, which is his microwave. Um, so what ended up happening is he, he decided that he's going to start taking his popcorn and stick it in the microwave for 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah, imagine what that, we actually had a home where some people burnt popcorn one time. If you've ever done that and like really burned it, you know you don't ever get that smell out of that microwave. But the other thing is it turned into a ball of fire after 10 minutes and it was a real problem. So. In our field, what do we normally do? You have someone that's there and they like popcorn. We, uh, we don't want to restrict their ability to have access to that. So what do you do in that situation? You add staff to it, right? Or you have an individual that has a lot of behaviors. Uh, they have staff and they have a lot of behaviors. Well, what do you do? Typically, you add more staff. You know, horrible idea, but there are no other options until this type of technology arrives. So this guy that he just wants to have a bag of popcorn, but he's having some issues with it. They call us in and they're like, this is what's going on. This is the barrier for us. All right. So let's, um, 
let's design a remote support system where we can kind of keep an eye on his apartment. He lives alone in the community in his own apartment, has some friends that come over at times that they really shouldn't, and he doesn't want them there, but he's too nice to say no, so he's like, hey, can you help me out a little bit? And, oh yeah, by the way, he turns popcorn into a big comet. Um, so what we decided to do is uh, we take some of these little sensors, which these are battery-operated wireless sensors. The battery lasts about five years in general. And we stick these around his apartment. Now we know that most of the folks that we serve do not live in their own home. Uh, they actually live in rental property. So we want to make sure that we're not going to damage it. We stick some of these things around the apartment so that we know when he's up and moving around. Though we have cameras that we can use here and there, we never put cameras in bedrooms or bathrooms. Privacy is always a huge thing with us. But for him, we wanted to know when he gets up. So we stick these things in his bedroom, in the hallway, in the kitchen, in the family room. Maybe we'll stick one in the bathroom because it can't see. It just knows when there's motion. So he gets up in the middle of the night and we see an alert in our center that he's up from the bedroom. He's moving in the hallway, he's in the kitchen, and then we have one of those handy dandy little sensors that are on his cabinet. He opens the cabinet, and our staff know him. They talk to him every day. They know him well. They call him up on that little two-way device, and uh, they're like, hey, Jim, 2 a.m., getting some popcorn? Yes, I am. Awesome. Well, just remember, when you put it in the microwave, just hit the popcorn button. And what we did is we stuck a little red sticker on the popcorn button and just hit the red sticker, no big deal. So he sticks it in the microwave and we hear doo 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 And it's like, oh no, that wasn't the popcorn button. Stuck that thing in for 10 minutes. And then he turns around and staff are like, so hey, you know, what do you got going on this weekend? Well, I'm going over to mom's, we're going to do this and this. Meanwhile, while they have their weird little headset on and they're talking to them and they're listening to everything, they're also looking at the clock on their computer and they're listening for the sound of the popcorn popping. They're hearing this and as they're talking with them, they hear the popcorn slow down and it's not popping as much. And they remind them, hey, okay, sounds like it's about time to take the popcorn out of the microwave. And he just, you know, he's not ignoring them, but he's carrying on conversation with them and keeps talking. So they let it go for another couple of seconds. They're like, hey, all right, let's go. Awesome, great story. Uh, Why don't we go ahead and take that popcorn out now? And he still just kind of carries on because, you know, he's having a conversation with them, good old time. So our staff reach up on their computer and they go, click. And they click a button that from our monitoring center, they shut off his microwave. And they don't say anything to him. <laughs> when he's done, they're like, hey, popcorn's done, you know, watch out, it's hot. And it was kind of one of those things. And that's it. He can have popcorn. He doesn't have to have staff there all the time. Um, we, as an agency, had an individual that we were serving uh, that is very high functioning, has some mental retardation, has some mental health issues, and is amazing with history. I have never met anyone, seriously, never met anyone in my life that knew so much about history. Um, the thing about her is she's just really grumpy. She kind of doesn't like anyone. Um, talking a little bit about my, uh, my desire to get into law enforcement, I didn't exactly let that boyish desire go while I've been working here. I also had a, uh, well, it's been 21 years now, career in law enforcement. And uh, so she knew that I was also a police officer and would call me some funny names and made me feel weird, but you know, certainly never anything that I hadn't heard before. And um, she let it be known that she just didn't really like people. But she needed people because of the choices that she made in her life. And she actually had to have 24 hour staffing. So we would provide a direct support staff person 24 hours a day in her apartment. Um, the first thing that she decided to start to do uh, after calling them names was to try to get them out of her life. She started smoking a lot, um, a lot. So our staff are getting ill. You know, we try to put the air purifiers in there, and, and you know how that's going to go. When she's smoking that much in an apartment that's half the size of this room, there's just no way around it. Our staff start becoming ill. 
and uh, we have some health issues, and we try to curb that, but it's her right to smoke as much as she wants, so we try to deal with that. Well, when that didn't run staff out, she decided she was going to try something else. Those staff that are allowed to sleep at night, she doesn't allow for them to sleep at night. And what we're talking about is for those of us in the, uh, in the agency world, the HPC world, we know that we have on-site on-call staff. Um, us providing on-site on-call staff, as we know in general anyways, it actually costs an agency provider $3 per hour more to have on-site on-call staff than we get reimbursed for it. So that's kind of a deal. But we, we have to do that. We have the lower rate, but she actually makes the staff stay up all night. And she tells those staff, while I'm in bed, you're going to sit in this chair, not on my couch. You're going to sit in the chair and you're going to stay awake all night. You're not allowed to listen to my radio. You're not allowed to watch my TV. You're going to sit there all night long and do nothing. And then she would leave. And as she leaves, she walks up to the thermostat, turns it all the way up. And then she walks into her bedroom, shuts the door, opens the sliding door in her room on her balcony. She gets plenty of nice fresh air in and make sure that the staff are just miserable. Um, she gets up about every hour, hour and a half throughout the night and checks on staff to make sure they're suffering the way that she wants for them to suffer. We start burning through staff members like crazy and it gets to the point where I have a case manager who at our agency is the, uh, the counterpart to the county board's SSAs I have a case manager and a human resource manager sitting in my office in tears. They're like, we are burning through staff like crazy. We can't continue to do this. We have to do something. I said, well, hey, I know this guy that knows something about remote support. And maybe we can do that. Something tells me maybe she just doesn't like to have staff room. And it's a crazy idea because of the behaviors that she had. But um, we approached the support team <clears throat> and uh, said, hey, here's a wacky idea. Let's try remote support. Let's just pull staff out. So we go to her that morning and uh, said, hey, um, we have this idea. What would you think about us putting this equipment in your home and not having staff there? She said, fine, I hate you. And here's the stipulations. was kind of the way the story went. And the stipulation was you can put a remote monitoring system. That's what they used to call it back then. You can put a remote monitoring system in place no cameras and no internet. And I said, so you're telling me I can put this system in your place, these sensors around, as long as there's no cameras, no internet. Yep. Okie dokie. So we were working with the county board that day. We immediately moved on that. By 2.30 that afternoon, we had a full room remote monitoring system in place. That system was specific to her. No camera, no internet. Got it. But she lived in this apartment complex where her neighbors would come in and take advantage of her. Uh, they would steal her money, they would steal her medication, they would steal her cigarettes. So we wanted to make sure that not only were we caring for her, but we were also providing for her safety and security as well. Um, that night, when afternoon staff left at 11 o'clock at night, we said, hey, uh, you're, this is, here you go, you're on your own for the night, bye. And they walked out the door and are the system. We had trained her on how to use it, which is basically there's nothing to do because we do it all on our end. <clears throat> but we said, um, have a great night. If you need anything, hit that button and we'll be right there for you. Now, when we do remote support, we do not want to take risks with people. So although our words to her were, see you later, you're on your own, the truth is we had a direct support staff person sitting in a car, company van, hanging out all night long just outside of her door. So within four seconds, they could be there if there was any need for anything. And we did that. Um, they left. New person came, started hanging out in the van, and immediately we start getting signals from her home. She's opening the door, opening the windows, trying to get into this and this and this. And our monitoring center staff were like, hey, how's it going? Do you need anything? No, I'm fine. And she's kind of grumpy now. <clears throat> After about two hours of that, everything died down. Everything stopped. The direct support staff out in the car knew everything's fine. They have an eye on the place. She's in there. Everything's just A-OK. -okay. 
Um, and everything just stopped. She went to bed. We had no motion. This is for someone that gets up every hour. We had no motion throughout her home the entire night. We know that she slept well. She gets into work the next morning, and I end up getting a call from the county board. And so we get that. You county board folks, Lori, will love this because it's the provider gets the call. Hey, the county board's on the line. They want to talk to you. Ah. All right. So I'm instant messaging my monitoring center. Hey, how it go? What's going on? What's the update? What's happening? And I pick up the phone. Go, hey, this is Jerry. What's up? And they identify themselves and says, I want to talk to you about her. All right. And they said, what did you do? Uh, started a new service last night. They said, I don't know what you did, but she came into work today happy. Oh, amazing. That's all she wanted. Now, she's not happy every day. You know, she's happy for her, but it was very clear. She just didn't want direct support staff. And we've not had any other alternative to that. This is someone that has a high level of need, and we didn't have any other alternative to that by that point in time. And so what we found is that we can do this, we can support people that have always been thought of as needing to have someone there. We can now have people that are able to live alone independently in the community because of this. But the technology that we use depends on that particular person. So when we go out to perform those assessments, what we look at is what do they need, and because of that, what does that system need to have, uh, you know, seizure disorders or medication reminders or whatever, but also what about the home? Uh, you know, how many doors and windows, what are, the, what are the environmental type of concerns that we might have? And every single remote support system that we have is specifically designed for that particular person. Like I said, there may be some times where um, it's a standalone type of service even, you know, someone that uh, has not been able to be alone because if they cook, they're going to burn the place down. Well, let's use a device like this that will actually monitor their activity, and before it becomes an unsafe situation, it'll just shut that device off. Um, this is a cook stop that controls the stove. It can be used independently, um, or it can be used in conjunction with our remote support systems. Um, I could talk about this forever. What questions do you guys have? Any questions so far? Thoughts, interests? Okay, next example. Um, let's see. <clears throat> yeah. Is there any other med dispenser other than that? That gigantic thing? Day? Is there anything that does monthly or? Um, well, it depends on how many medications are needing to be taken. Uh, so like this one, if it's someone that needs to have it set up, there are trays that can be swapped out with it at the end of the week that, you know, a pharmacist or a nurse can set up. Uh, Philips has some med dispensers that we use uh, periodically. And again, um, it could last a month depending on how many medications that person takes. Okay. So, yes, absolutely. Now, one of the things about remote support, too, or any technology, is that... Um, when we approach people with the use of technology, we say, hey, have an open mind. Because a lot of times people have this notion of what it is, that it's cameras watching everything, or whatever that may be. But the fact of the matter is that people just don't know what they don't know. And we actually have a team of people that full-time, every single day, are researching available technologies. And there are times that the technology that's available doesn't meet the needs. Um, we, as uh, I believe we're still presently providing the majority of all remote monitoring services across the state, uh, we have been able to uh, have the power to approach different technology providers and say, hey, I like what you're doing, but it's not functioning quite the way we need to. If you do this to it, we're going to buy a whole bunch of them and use them uh, and have been able to do that to meet some unique needs that we've had. Um, we need to make sure that we create the system that's just right for the person. And yours is a great example. Med dispenser is great, but it needs to be able to hold more medication than that. Um, sometimes we might say no. As a direct support provider, 
I knew going into this that there are going to be times that someone's going to ask for us to provide remote support, and I have to say no due to behavioral issues or health issues. You get that guy around the cheeseburger, and he's going to choke every time, right? And we're like, eh, we can't really, we might not be able to handle that. So I knew that we were going to have to say no from time to time, but what has surprised me with this has been that the instances in which we would have to say no to services have been fewer and further between than we had ever imagined. Um, what we have found with the use of technology for folks has been that it has created uh, greater freedom and independence and privacy for people. It's enhanced their lives um, more than we ever anticipated that it would, even with our uh, you know, big dreams that we had. And we also found that using these technologies have had a greater impact on the providers that are being served. And, you know, make no mistake, I, I am not saying that this is anything about financial gain, but when we're in a system that has that unsustainable business model where it is costing the providers way more than they get to provide the service, now all of a sudden you have a, a, a service that can be used that not only better impacts the people, gives them a better life, but it also has a positive impact on the provider as well. When we have times where we're in a system that the individuals being served don't have anyone that will serve them because providers like me are like, I just don't have staff. Now we can have more staff. Uh, we, um, we've recently had times where our agency Bi-weekly payroll, we've had over 800 hours of overtime. That's huge. Imagine what that amount of money is that we're paying out. It's huge. But by implementing something like this, we can take that staff person that is working 60, 70, 80 hours a week, and we can give them time off. Time that they can now go spend with their families. Time that, number one, they can just kick back and relax and not have all that overtime. But the other thing is we're reducing burnout from staff, which means we're reducing staff turnover. When we're talking about providing direct supports, everybody always wants to have that person in the home that stays there. You don't want that revolving door of people in and out of your life constantly. And by using technologies like this, we found that we're able to keep staff there more. So it's been a win-win for the individuals that are using the service as well as the providers that are using it. Um, and when we as a remote support vendor have partnered with other organizations, we found uh, the example that on-site on-call rate, which providers are losing $3 an hour more. So they're just going to say, we're not providing the service anymore. Well, when they partner with us and they provide remote support technologies by using uh, their staff is the backup support staff, for example. Now, they're gaining $3 an hour for doing nothing. Uh, we found agencies that are able to offset some of those overtime issues, some of the problems that we have. And so, knowing your organization, let's use you as an example, that um, you decide we are going to get certified to provide remote monitoring. It doesn't mean you're actually providing any of the monitoring. We're still the vendor. But if one of the individuals that you're serving uses it and they need to have paid backup support staff, then you're certified for that. And the way that that works is that every hour of remote monitoring, you're billing $9.83. I'm going to charge you way less than that to actually provide the service for you. That profit, you just keep it. That helps offset other costs. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the catch. It's paid backup support staff, so that means that I might have to call your staff out sometime and get them to respond. Our average for calling out paid backup support staff is two times per year for our entire agency. We pick up the phone for all the vendors that we use all across the state. We pick up the phone on average only two times a year and say, hey, can your staff please respond? Because think about it. If there's an emergency and staff need to respond, we're not calling them. We're calling police, fire, EMS first. They're going to get there right away. 
And then we call them and let them do whatever they have to do. So we have that part of it. Now, what we do call staff for quite a lot, or agencies for quite a lot, is to say, hey, uh, your staff didn't show up to work. Uh, where are they at? You know, there's those sorts of things. The gray area of service delivery is gone now. We have data. Here's exactly what it is. Or if there's an MUI in the home, we have video footage. Here's exactly what happened. There's no more of this questioning things and IAs doing interviews of staff. Here's the video clip. Here's all the reports. Good to go. Um, so we have found that the use of remote support has been a win all around when it's appropriate. And if it's not appropriate, we simply say no. Does that bring any other questions so far? So if we had an individual that we thought could benefit from remote monitoring, and we had the backup staff to do just what you described, um, is it the county board that initiates with you for that assessment, or would we initiate with you for um, that assessment? I always want for the support team to work harmoniously to provide okay. the best service. So I would say um, certainly get a hold of the SSA, say, hey, here's what we're thinking. Get a hold of the guardians if the individuals have them. We want to make sure that everybody's on board. The people that we're monitoring must consent to it. The people that we're monitoring have to be okay with all of that. And if at any time we are providing the remote support, the individual says, hey, I don't like this, I want you to shut it off. We have to respond to that and we have to shut the service off. That service will not be shut off until backup support staff arrive. Um, in all of our years of doing this across the state, I think we've had once maybe twice that we have uh, stopped the service for someone for any reason, um, and that's it. So we want to make sure that the entire support team is on board with this, and uh, we as the vendor just say, give it a chance, because uh, it is absolutely uh, shocking to see what the folks have been able to do with the technologies that they have. Yes, ma'am. I'm just going to jump in on that um, particular topic. As superintendent for Sandusky County Board, um, my guidance and encouragement has been if there's someone on the team that feels like this is a service that would be beneficial, I think if it's the provider, I am very welcome to having them present that and encourage, like, hey, can we schedule a meeting? Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't have to be the SSA that's the one that's driving that conversation and like, oh, wow, we can do this. So if there's a member of the team as the provider, you think that this is something that should be considered? By all means, Great. bring it up. Okay. Great. Thank you. What other questions? Go ahead, sir. Uh, it's a financial question, I guess. Um, I'm not sure exactly what she does, uh, if she's a provider or not. But you had stated that it saves a provider three bucks. Yep. Um, and then you had mentioned that she, they, they charge nine bucks per hour or whatever, and that you charge considerably less. With RSS providing the services, isn't I guess is that contract completely yours, or is the provider still being able to bill, and then you're charging the provider? Uh, so here's the way that it works: um, if you are the provider of record for paid backup support staff, the state has a very clear rate for that service is nine dollars and eighty-three cents per hour. Um, that is the same no matter where you're at, regardless of cost of doing business category. And it's full hours only. It is not a unit-based rate, unfortunately. So what happens is we actually provide that service. You would enter into an agreement with us um, where we say, hey, here's the thing. Um, we are going to make sure that we maintain the equipment. We keep it running. We're going to provide all the monitoring. We're going to provide you with documentation of that. In exchange, we would like for you to maintain certification and pay us. Um, so very simple uh, agreement, but that's in place. And then um, what we do is we track everything on doc sheets that meet all you know waiver requirements, just like HPC, and uh, we will keep all of that stuff. We are responsible for what happens when remote monitoring is occurring. So just because you're the one that's accessing those waiver dollars for that, and we will explain, um, we are still responsible for what we do as a monitoring center. We're not passing any of that off to you. 
Um, but what we do do is we keep all of that and we build that. So every week, um, Monday and Tuesday, we enter data at five o'clock on Tuesday night and email is automatically sent to you that contains all of that billing data for the previous week. Um, it's going to have the rate that we agree on in there so that you know what's coming. But what you're gonna do is use that number of units to build the waiver for that and hopefully you'll do that by noon on Wednesday so you'll get it in with regular deadline. And um, you're gonna bill for that higher rate of 983 an hour. And then pay you the end of the month. What happens is I'm going to send you an invoice. You've meanwhile the entire month been collecting those payments, um, and then at the end of the month, I send you an invoice for all of the services we provided uh, for that month, and it's going to exactly match what you've been seeing throughout the week. Uh, what we also do with that is we enter the service authorizations that you have. So our system will not allow us to bill anything if it's not authorized appropriately through pause. So we enter those same numbers of units so we're not getting into any sort of overutilization. And we monitor utilization. If we see that uh, your individual is using more remote support hours than normal, then you and I are gonna talk about it, let you have that kind of conversation with the SSA and say, hey, um, we've had less staff there, more monitoring, or you know, whatever the situation's been, we just work that out and um, make sure that we're all on the up and up with everything. Mm -hmm. Answer your question? Absolutely, thank you. Yeah, very easy, very um, very simple process with that. But um, the way that that works is, like you said, you're going to sit back and you're going to collect that 983 an hour. And I'm assuming that there's something that you're going to have worked out to have that on-call paid backup support staff. Most agencies already have that in place with someone anyways. Um, so you're just gonna collect that money and do what you please with it. You're not having to do anything more than you presently are. If that person does get called out to respond to the home, from the moment they get the call and have to leave wherever they are, they can start billing their HPC services. So your lesser charge of 983 stops and you start billing the regular HPC rate. Yep. So they're driving from their home to the individual's home. When they get there, we stop monitoring. So during that period of time where they're driving, you're billing and we're billing both at the same time and that is permissible. Once we verify that your staff are there to provide supervision, we stop serving. You're like, hey, we got it from here, super duper. And we stop. You take care of the problem, and your staff person gets ready to go. They call us up, use video device, whatever they're gonna do. Hey, just so you know, got it all taken care of. We're good to go, we're gonna leave. All right, we got it from here. And you'll see on our device, we have a status indicator light on the device that even confirms to you visually, yep, their system's on, they are now monitoring what's happening. So we start billing, uh, your person is continuing to bill all the way until they get back to wherever they're going. And then once that happens, they stop and they transition back to that other rate, that lower rate. Okay. Yeah. Very good stuff. Do you have a geographic area that you do this in? Because some of our operations are like as far as Lorraine County. Ohio. Okay. Yeah. Good. How's that for a location? That covers us. We, uh, we have actually been asked if we would go out of state. We are not interested in doing business outside of, or outside of the state of Ohio, um, but we do serve just about everywhere in Ohio, which is interesting because um, there are places where technology is not as available. We, uh, we have banjo country that we're in, so we have to look at how do you get that signal there, and, um, and we are able to effectively do that. So, yes. We can provide the service anywhere. What's important? is that paid backup support person needs to be local there. And that's why we partner with people like you guys. Um, Lorraine County, if that's, if that's where some of your other places are at. Mm -hmm. um, we do not have direct support staff there, and um, we would count on a local provider to be able to do that. Another neat thing about our agreement that we would have with you is that you know there used to be the issue of providers wanting to take staff from other providers. So that agreement has built into it, 
our ironclad, apparently, agreement that we said, look, hey, I don't want your staff. We just want to be able to help provide services. Um, so we're all clear, we all love each other, and things go well, and we're all harmonious. So there's language about that in there as well. So, yes, ma'am. Yes, you have to be on a, um, a Medicaid or a, a waiver to get any of the help? Um, we do, and some of that's going to be dependent upon local resources. And so let's talk about some of the options. Uh, number one, Everything that I talk about up here is waiver reimbursable service. Uh, there are many times where a county board has reimbursed for these services as well because they know that it's far less expensive than providing direct support staff. Um, there are other times where, no, you don't have to have waivers. We do not accept private insurance. But one of the examples that, that I'm thinking about right now is we'll have someone come to us say, hey, uh, we would like to see if you can provide remote support for my brother who lives in my home with me uh, and gets home from work before I do. So we'll go out there and um, we'll just kind of perform an assessment. And in some of these assessments, it might be that, yeah, he gets home at 3.15 and I get home from work at 5.30. What I need to know is that he's just okay. He's typically okay at home alone, but sometimes he'll just leave the door wide open. We want to make sure that the door is closed. Or it's okay for him to take the dog for a walk, but he needs to be back within 20 minutes. And if he's not, we need to know. So what we can do is, instead of providing the full moon remote support system, what we might do is pretty much just put in a home security system. Um, with that system, it can be set up so that we're not even monitoring it. Uh, it could be that the family monitors that on their own and they know that he's supposed to be home at 315. If he doesn't enter the home by 315, that system can send a message to the family and say, hey, uh, he's not here. And then they can follow up accordingly. Uh, it can be that if he leaves and walks the dog and he doesn't come back, it lets him know. These systems have even been designed so that the family members can view in on cameras in their own home and see what's happening. Oh, yep, there he is sitting on the chair, eating Cheetos, you know, perfect. Um, so when someone doesn't have uh, a funding mechanism such as an IO level one self waiver, typically it's because um, they haven't needed it to that point, hopefully. And uh, that means that we're probably gonna be able to use a different type of technology to serve them. What we try to do in our technology solutions that we provide is go very low tech first. I want to start with the most simple thing that I can and only go all the way up to remote support if that's what's needed. Um, I had another county uh, contact me a while back because they had an individual that receives 24 hour staffing. Um, they have an agency provider that's in there and the agency provider's staff is on site on call at night, which means that they can sleep. Um, they said, hey, here's the problem. Um, Staff are allowed to sleep at night, and they have one guy that they're serving. He was just at the therapist, and whatever went down, the therapist said, that staff person needs to be awake at night. The provider said, well, we can't do that. We need that staff to work other places. They need to be able to sleep at night and be able to work other places for us during the day. Like, what can you do so that they continue to sleep? Well, let me find out. <clears throat> so I went over there, and we just sat down and we met, and I looked around the apartment. I spoke with the SSA and the individual and mom, and um, when I turned to the guy that was living there, I said, okay, what do you think? You know, can we put something in here so the staff can know when you're up? Because no problem if he's in his bedroom moving around, playing video games all night, but they just want to know when he leaves his room. He said, I don't mind if you put something up, but no alarms. Okay, what do you mean by an alarm? He said, well, I don't want you to put something in my home that beeps when I walk out the door and makes me feel like I can't leave it. <clears throat> okay, so I grab one of these things, and I'm like, so would you mind if I take this motion detector, stick it on the ceiling above your bedroom door, and it's an apartment, so it's double stick tape, can I stick that there and then put a pager on your staff person? 
Um, my alarm clock when I wake up in the morning is uh, a Fitbit that vibrates, and it does a really good job of not making any noise but waking me right up. Four o'clock in the morning has never felt so good, let me tell you. <laughs> so um, I wanted to do that for them, and it worked. So he said, yeah, I don't care. So I went in, stuck the motion detector above his door, I paired it up with a, uh, a pager that the staff person put on their belt, and the couch that they slept on was about 10 feet away from his bed in this very small apartment. He walks through the doorway, pager starts to vibrate, wakes them up, and they know what to do. Everybody was happy. It cost like $60 for that one-time purchase of the equipment, um, and they were good to go. It's hard to tell him what the solution is going to have to be until we get out there. Um, sky's the limit with it. Do you accept private pay? We do. I'll take money from anybody. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. But a security system not covered by uh, wa on waivers and stuff like that. You had to pay for that yourself. Not necessarily. Many times, um, security systems we do as adaptive and assistive equipment, so not a problem with that. Uh, one of the waiver services for people, especially with an, an I.O. or an individual options waiver, uh, does cover that. Like I said, everything, Everything that I'm talking about here, whether it be GPS tracking for person, personal emergency response system, medication dispenser, remote support, adaptive and assistive equipment, um, waivers will pay for that. So they're fun things to get a hold of. Right, boss? Where do you get those? Um, that's what you need to work with your uh, SSA on that whole process of qualifying for that and availability of local resources and all that. Yep, absolutely. Not necessarily a walk in the park to get that, but when you have it, um, sure is handy. And here's the thing. For the folks that we serve that are on waivers, and most of the people that we serve are, I need to be responsible for that money. That's, that's your Medicaid money. That's our taxpayer dollar. So what can I do as a citizen to make the best use of that money? And if I can provide a service that is $6, an hour versus twenty dollars an hour, and the person has a better, happier, healthier life because of that. That's a win-win for everybody. Those are the sorts of things that we want to consider. You got more questions? What do you think? No, I'm just thinking how this might. <clears throat> tons of tons of neat things that we can do. Um, boy, look at that. It's not even 7 o'clock yet. I told you. I told you we might wrap it up a little bit early. Any other questions, thoughts, comments, concerns? Lori, what do you think? Are there any other technology devices that we haven't talked about that are out there? I mean, I know you said you can work with pretty much anything, but is there anything big that we should walk out of here knowing? I walked in late for another meeting. Have you talked about like the um, the bed alarms, the seizure alarms, fall? We've we've touched on um, seizure detection. We've talked about fall detection. We can talk about um, yes. I mean, oh my goodness, serving people that have visual or hearing impairments. Um, this person can never be alone because he can't hear the smoke detector go off at night. Let's give him a strobe light. Oddly enough, you stick a strobe light over someone's bed, they'll see it, even when they're sleeping. It'll wake them up. I sleep with my phone next to my bed. I'm not really sure why, because I put it on vibrate mode. I do not hear it when it goes off. And I don't use it as an alarm clock, because I use that Fitbit on my wrist. But one thing that happens is, in the middle of the night, I have some, some sort of crazy friend that posts an update or sends me a message on Facebook and it lights the phone up and it lights up my room and I wake up to it. I don't look at it. They're not that good of a friend, but it's there. Um, yeah, it is just probably Dan. Um, but, oh my goodness, the, I wouldn't even know where to start. GPS tracking, elopement systems for people on the autism spectrum. That's you know the other thing that uh, family members that just cannot.
turn their back for a moment, that can't catch a break because of elopement issues. Uh, we have systems that are able to, to help with that. Um, RFID trackers for people or GPS tracking. Remote monitoring is presently only available for use in the home. Now, there's talk and there's, there's um, some movement towards making that community-based as well, but right now that's only in the home. But we do have folks that have to have GPS tracking devices. Um, they choose to have GPS tracking devices because of other freedoms that come along with that, but uh, we're able to do that as well. Or like we said, um, being able to be alone because now you can have seizure detection. Um, this is something that I worry about with uh, my youngest daughter has a seizure disorder, and she's very uh, sensitive to temperature. So we have temp sensors in her room, and we know if, if there's a condition um, environmentally that we need to tend to so that she can avoid having a seizure, or if she does have a seizure, we know. Um, you know, not only do I know the difference in sound between her jumping off of her bed and her whole body hitting the floor, um, but we can also detect that for monitoring centers as well. Um, the advances in technology nowadays are such that uh, someone that does have a uh, seizure disorder can have a watch that looks like any other normal watch that can detect that, whether through you know, subcutaneous whatever, sweating, um, you know, the motion of the seizure, depending on what kind they have, and it can send messages um, to get help. The sky really is the limit. So I think that's why it's great that the state of Ohio has moved to a technology first state. Um, there's a pretty good chance that no matter what we're talking about as far as someone's needs, there's probably some sort of a technology that can enhance their lives. Wouldn't you agree? You guys are a great group of folks. I see one, two, three, four, Five, Dave's got one. I'm looking at cell phones. You know, um, we have, we all use technology so much in our lives and we don't even think about it anymore. Um, technology can be very simple from that adaptive spoon all the way up to computers and robots and whatever else we have. But the fact of the matter is that when we, within the developmental disabilities community, talk about the use of technology, it is never to replace people. The technology that we use always brings people closer together. That's our focus and that's the difference with what we're talking about here. So I know it's hard to get a really firm grasp on all of this when there's millions and millions of different possibilities, but my thing is to be here to say, there are some pretty cool things that are happening out there and what you need to do is just work with your support team, work with us, and I'm not the only remote support provider, well, kind of in town, but there are, you know, free choice of providers. There are a number of remote support providers. Um, contact people. Don't make my funny jokes make you feel uncomfortable to the point where you don't use it. Um, seek people out and, you know, look at the services that are available because there really is some cool stuff that we can use to make uh, those folks in our lives as free and independent as possible. Miss anything? All right. You better run while you can. Thank you, Jared. You got information. If you need anything else, let us know. Thank Appreciate you. It. All right. Thank you, guys.